You look like a lively group here. <laughs> I know uh, everybody from this group understands what I mean. <laughs> it just feels like Hollywood squares. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And, and Milt, you are definitely George Goebel. <laughs> I don't know if that's good or bad. <laughs> Sneaky funny. <laughs> Devin, are we live streaming? It says live on it. I'm getting in there right now. Just one moment. Thank you. Yeah, I can't. I haven't seen the live feed yet, but I'll try it. My screen claims that we're live. All I'm seeing is the upload of the meeting from the 13th of April. Devin, are you finding it? Uh, it's loading right now. You may have to click out uh, back onto the channel. Yep, now it's up. Okay. Yes, we are streaming. Thank you very much, Devin. Devin? Are you finding it? Uh, it's loading right now. All right, we're good. Live streaming A-OK, -okay, right, Devin? Uh, there he is. Yeah, there's a bit of lag, but it is streaming. Oh, Mike's here. There he is. Good evening, Mike. Let's make sure he's connected with us audio, and uh, we'll start the meeting. Hi, Mike. Mike, can you hear us? Can you hear us now, Mike? Hmm. Doesn't appear that we can hear him. Right. Can you hear us now, Mike? He can hear us. We can't hear you at all. Is volume down? Is he muted? Like no, I was. It, it, it's not showing that he's muted. No. How do you tell? It show, um, go look at Devin's right now. It shows a little mic and it's crossed out. You have to click on the participants window, Suzanne. Oh, yeah.
He's just going to have to hold a sign up. <laughs> Scientific and industrial, all at your disposal. We're... What? That was me. <laughs> all right. Mr. Trump's in the house. How about now, Mike? Can he call in on one of the numbers? That, that's what I was just thinking. Hey, Mike, can you hear us okay? He's calling in. Yeah, he's calling in. This is live streaming. Those people aren't seeing much excitement. <laughs> is anybody watching, Devin? 21. Oh, 21 viewers. Jake almost busted in on the party. Oh no. <laughs> you're yelling from out there. I thought I better intercept this one. I pre warned everyone. It's time to be quiet. <laughs> he wasn't here. Oh. <laughs> Tell him he'll have to pull a ballot application if he wants to try and join the team. <laughs> I'll tell him. We can interview him tonight and see what we think. Can you undo that mute, Kevin, from where you're at, or does he have to do that? Oh, he just ended. Can you hear? You there, Mike? Oh, he's on the phone with Kevin. Ah. We may have to just move on and get this meeting started. I agree. I think if 
if it's seven ten, he's not on. We just need to move on without him. There's numbers that you can call to have to just use the phone. Okay. I had him uh, call in on one of the numbers. Okay. And hopefully he does that uh, in short order. In the meantime, okay. let's call to order this meeting of the Tecumseh Board of Education for Monday, May 11th, 2020. We have the Pledge of Allegiance led by Mr. Tim Simpson. <clears throat> Flag up. America, and to the republic for which it stands, stands. one nation, nation under, God, under God, indivisible, indivisible. liberty and justice for all. Justice for all. <clears throat> all right, first up, we have Mr. Hilderly with our good news for the meeting. We have uh, a few things on the list. First of all, uh, Teacher Appreciation Week was uh, last week, as I know you're aware. Um, and the district uh, worked with the association to come up with uh, a relatively unique way of um, marking the week. Um, we felt that while teachers uh, and school staff have been working hard and certainly deserve our recognition and appreciation that in this unique situation that also working hard at home uh, to be teachers in this situation are, are many of our parents and families. So the association and the administration uh, worked together to forego what would typically be a t-shirt or some sort of um, item to, to mark the event um, and allocate that money to families. So we are currently sending out um, 100 $25 gift certificates to uh, needy families in Tecumseh as identified by each building. Uh, we've shared a Google document so that they're, uh, you know, we can avoid redundancy, but um, just felt like that was a better way to, uh, to use those funds while not certainly um, undermining anybody's appreciation for what our staff uh, have been doing and always do, but um, just marking the occasion uh, a little differently and uh, appreciate the TEA's um, agreement with our perspective on that one. So that's good news. Um, food service. Um, in March, we served uh, almost 16,000 meals, 15,906 to be exact, um, from the time the executive order went in place until the end of March. And then April, uh, the number was 47,143 meals that uh, were served. Um, and then uh, you know, May, uh, having just started is a, is a smaller number, but um, well over, uh, 60,000 meals provided by the district to this point. So very happy to uh, announce those numbers. And then lastly, uh, our athletic department is attempting uh, in some way to replace some of the revenue that athletic programs would typically have um, in the spring and summer with a lot of the camps that they would provide for our student athletes. Um, and by what they're doing is uh, every Friday um, having a drive through drop off of returnable cans. So uh, that's available to um, anyone in the district or from with, well, outside the district. Um, you can place those in uh, garbage bags and drop those off at the storage building at the south end of the campus near the soccer field. Um, and make those donations to the athletic department. And, and it'll be redistributed among the programs who, um, like I said, use the summertime as a way to uh, supplement their fundraising. 
So those are the three good news items and um, happy about all of those. All right, next up is our public comment. We had no registrants for the public comment. So that'll move us to the board agenda. Do we have any revisions? If not, can we get a motion to approve the agenda as written, please? Hi, Kevin, I move to uh, remove the action item that's on the agenda for this evening. Um, we've always said that we're gonna discuss items first before we take action. And this one kind of came out of nowhere, so. This, uh, the item that, that uh, Mr. Simpson's referring to is a resolution um, and resolutions don't require the normal uh, two meetings for reading and then discussion and uh, then action. Uh, it's an emergency provision. So um, it's on as a discussion item first and, and then the board could decide whether or not they wanted to take action uh, from that discussion. It's a it's a recommendation from uh, Neola, who provides our policy manuals, and uh, Suzanne will talk a little bit more about it in the um, uh, policy committee report. Yeah. Well, again, I make a motion to approve the agenda without the action item at this time. So, can we just change it later if we want after the discussion? After the discussion, we can move to set it aside or table it until the next meeting. Or we can get an approval to, uh, or we can get a second for Tim's motion so we can discuss at this meeting and vote on it the next. Either one is appropriate. I make a motion that we accept the agenda as is. And if we feel we need to change it, then we'll change it after we discuss it. Second. Second to which motion, Becky? Uh, Suzanne's. Just to clarify, we have a second. We will take a vote. Milt? Aye. Kevin? Aye. Suzanne? Aye. John? Tim? No. Becky? Aye. The ayes have it. The motion carries to approve the agenda as written. First up, we have our scheduled reports on the agenda. Monthly finance reports. Give me just a second to let Nikki in and we'll start. Guys hear me? Yeah. Yep. Welcome, Nikki. Thank you. Um, I included in this uh, meetings packet your normal monthly uh, financial reports. Um, this one had um, it was quite a bit larger than your normal monthly reports. We had our bond payment this month, um, and uh, I don't know if you looked through there, but there was quite a few refunds, and we're going to be continuing to do those for field trips that uh, parents had paid for. Um, you guys hear me? Yeah. Yep, welcome, Nikki. Um, yeah. And um, um, I all kinds of things. This, so uh, just kind of a... meetings packet, your normal monthly uh, financial reports. Uh, something happened there. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to ask if any of you had any questions first. 
announced. Is that the last bond payment or do we still have a couple more payments left on that or? Well, our bond payment will reduce next year, but we still have bond payments until 2029, but it will reduce next year. Part of it falls off next year. Okay. Do you know how much it reduces by? I know it reduces by 2.7 mils, but I don't okay. have a dollar amount. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Uh, the good news about that, which is, um, I was going to mention this later, but it's um, it's really good, is that so last year in 1819, we started investing those uh, funds differently than we had done in the past and um, were able to achieve a much higher interest rate. And so as a result of that, um, we're actually going to be able to um, reduce that bond millage um, because legally we're not allowed to collect more than the bond payment. Um, and the interest. So since we've been able to, uh, you know, create more from those funds specifically, we'll be able to reduce the millage even more than what we are obligated to do so. All right. Any other questions for Nikki on the finance report? All right. Well, thank you very much, Nikki. It was a pleasure to see you. Thank you. Next up, the board policy committee meeting minutes from Suzanne Moore. Oh, you unmuted me. Okay. <clears throat> Basically, um, we reviewed two sections and actually uh, all the hard work was done, I think, by Mark from Neola and uh, with the COVID, they had time to really go through it thoroughly. Um, but we, we all met and ha at the meeting, we went through it again, but they had already gone through it before us, Terry and, uh, and uh, our beautiful superintendent. And anyways, basically we, we went through the 1000 series and uh, we reviewed the 2000 series, which was super long. Uh, the 1000 series basically uh, talks about superintendent's evaluation and criminal work history, leave of absences, privacy, affordable care act, medical leave, stuff like that. The 2000 is about uh, parent family engagement and uh, curriculum direct directives or development in mandatory courses in the core, core curriculum, Title I, um, trips are in there, health. And basically, we also talked about legal updates with COVID-19 issues. Um, the committee members, we reviewed the recent legal updates issued from NEOLA covering the COVID-19 related matters. Uh, NEOLA has provided a resolution to the board to consider approving, which would grant emergency powers to the superintendent during this time of crisis, as the resolution grants authority to the superintendent to react to certain situations by temporary waiving bo board policies and provisions of the board if the superintendent shall be, if he deems necessary. So within reason, um, we'll talk more about this when we, you know, under discussion. We'll go into more detail and Rick can explain, you know, what situations he would use it in and where he absolutely would not. And um, that's basically it. We also went over policy 8450. The district currently has that policy. However, it was uh, reissued, was updated to, to include COVID-19. So basically we all supported all of the uh, changes and updates and that's, a, that's gonna be the recommendation from the board committee. I mean, the policy uh, committee. That's basically it. All right, thank you, Suzanne. Next up, the board budget committee meeting minutes from Rebecca Brooks. Hi there. So we went over, uh, there's, there was a handout in your packet that was the proposed um, fiscal year 2021 budget considerations. And it had the final revised uh, fiscal year of the 1920 school year budget considerations. 
And if you if you take a look at that form, you're, you'll see where there's some breakouts of what we were mostly concerned about is the bottom line next year, of course. Um, the state's talking about some allowance reductions that could be pretty significant to our bottom line. Um, there's even a possibility that they may ask for some money back from this year, which is a little unnerving, but apparently not unheard of. So that's kind of all in play right now. We don't have a lot of um, concrete information, which has been kind of a problem for many things that we're doing right now. Um, one of the things that Nikki had broken out for us for the final revision is there was some, uh, well, well, it's savings, although it's unfortunate savings because we were not in, in session. Uh, we had some fuel savings, um, custodian supplies, snow removal, you know, various things like that. So we did realize uh, some more savings that actually will give us a, a better fund balance going into next year, which will be helpful since we don't know what we're going to get uh, for our state allowance. Uh, there's a breakout on that sheet for you. If anybody has any questions, uh, happy to answer. And I think that was um kind of the the bulk of it we talked about maybe some um contracts to renegotiate and look at uh to perhaps find some some cost savings going forward you want to go back and unmute oh sorry can you hear me now yes <laughs> i noticed when i was going through the check register that we wrote a check last month to mc business services for one hundred and seven thousand dollars for the copiers it's probably too late at this point but it it would, you know, and obviously it would have to have a vote from the board, but it might not be a bad idea to see if we could go back and change that to a lease versus a buy if the rest of the board members um, would agree to that. I, I'm, you're saying I from the vote before? We voted to purchase copiers before all this happened. Right. But in hindsight, it might be a better idea to try to lease those copiers and save that cash for the next five years, if we could. I don't know if we can. We'll, we'll have to uh, bring that up under discussion items. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, there you are. <laughs> Thank you very much. You try. Um, we are on to discussion items currently. Uh, I would uh, like to put forth that, John, we can certainly uh, discuss that topic, but that would require uh, some fact finding from Nikki and Mr. Hilderly. Let's have them do that and put it on the agenda for the next meeting. Would that suffice? No problem. Thank you very much. I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, did we? Did you have any public comment on agenda items only? No, we did not have a public comment on agenda items only. No registrants. Okay. So the discussion item, I'm assuming I wasn't coming through earlier. The discussion item we are currently on is the review of board policies 1000, 2000, and policy number 8450. I'll open the floor for anyone who would like to Begin discussion on that. I read through the series. Yeah. It looked all pretty straightforward. All right, Tim, you have your hand up. Oh, sorry. Uh, well, I did a while ago for the uh, um, for the um, report from the budget committee. Oh, oh sorry. Still up. Yep. So um, I'm wondering, did we look at the busing at all? And because we're not doing any busing right now and I see we're still paying them. I know Rick and I have discussed it, 
Um, I know there was an agreement with other superintendents, but it's a lot of money. And um, to be honest with you, they're going to make more money going on unemployment than what they're getting paid right now, the bus drivers, and what they're getting paid. They're we and, and we did not feel that that was um, something that we were going to look at for, uh, putting towards the board for a vote. Okay, because it's 450 some thousand dollars. We're not going to look at that. I don't know that those numbers are accurate. I'm just going based off of what the monthly spend is on it. So, well, we have contractually, we have $193,800 that we pay to first student every so, month. Correct. Okay. So, that that is so there's two months. So, that's uh, Thing. for for the or the savings that you'd realize for the things that you had brought forward it wouldn't equal that much okay so that was that we talked about perhaps so it equal three hundred eighty thousand because of april may part of june it's a lot of money it is a lot of money but it's not contractually there's we we are in a contract to pay that at this point okay. so that that would can have we to share be can we share the contract with the rest of the board then i'd like to see the contract i thought it went out but i will double check on that no nope, i didn't get a copy of it no nope. uh terry i think you were sharing that maybe could you send that to the entire board well i just sent the date that it expires i didn't send the contract but i will okay so and that was one of the things that we discussed that that could be up for discussion, especially given the situation right now where we don't know if we're gonna need it or not. We know of what? How school is gonna look next year. Are we gonna need buses? Are we gonna need extra buses? We just right. don't know at the moment. So it's hard to renegotiate a contract when you don't know what you're gonna to need to ask for. So that's kind of where we were at. and and. And one of the discussions in the budget committee was there were some errors that were found in billing that they brought to our attention. It was, you know, their error. They brought it to our attention and gave us the credit. I mean, they've been operating in good faith. Uh, so we would like to continue that spirit of good faith. Okay. Yeah, I'd like to see the contract because, again, it's a lot of money that could be raised for the teachers moving forward. So um, especially since we've been talking about maybe uh, – extending the contract and so forth. So um, that's a lot of money. So yeah, I'd like, I'd like to see the contract, so, yep. John, you had something to add? Yeah, I just wanted to mention, we did discuss um, busing during the budget mid meeting. And, um, you know, I think we're toting a fine line by, trying to renege on a contract you know we don't own buses we don't have a bus service um, we're working with first student and we have a contract with them um, I get that they're not um, you know using buses you know paying for that but they still have all their overhead that they have to take care of so I think that you know the what we talked about in the budget um, meeting was if the contract was gonna be coming up soon, we could try to renegotiate it with some additional items in it to help protect us from things like this. But I don't think our current contract would allow us to just renege on it. Um, and I don't think that that would be a, a good business decision, especially considering this is our one and only bus provider and we don't have the ability to bus students without them. As I recall, that that contract is good until 2029. So, but like I said, we also discussed the possibility that with the current situation, since we don't know what we're going to need going forward, that there may be they may be willing to um, renegotiate with us, just because of the fact that the situation has changed so drastically that no one could have foreseen. So we'll see. Budget committee's on it. Okay. And do we know if a student applied for PPP loans at all? Or That wouldn't be something we would know yet. 
Nikki might have that information, but um, that was not brought up at the at the meeting. Okay. I, I've not just, had that conversation with Ben, but um, we can find that out pretty easily. Yeah. Well, I just think we need to be looking at these things moving forward. That um, that's a lot of money we're leaving out there, and and if uh, you know we're not getting in service, but we're paying for it, it just doesn't make sense to me. So. Um, but, Again, Terry will get the contract to us and we'll go from there, so. Suzanne, did you have something to add? Yeah, I was gonna say, can you hear me? Yep. I was gonna say that my, my main concern and always has been with busing is that we have no idea who we're busing and we're, we have a lot of empty buses, I think, running routes that, you know, where we could do better. I just think we, and I know he was working on that and getting a list together because we had kids from several years ago that already graduated that were on the route, I think. And they were cleaning that up. And I just wanna make sure it's completely cleaned up and then it will be kept up to date. And then number, you know, number two is we probably have a lot of kids in the high school that cannot ride the bus if they're driving. I mean, I think we should at least compare kids who get a parking pass and ask people, especially ninth through 12th grade, or even younger, you know, parents, because a lot of parents want to drop their kids off. They never ride the bus. So we shouldn't be stopping at those houses if we don't have to. Well, and I want to make it perfectly clear. I'm not, you know, trying to kick the bus drivers off to the curb either. But I know for a fact they're going to make more money if they were to file unemployment right now and got laid off. Uh, right. The $600 but, but, stimulus they, of the federal they, government is kicking in. Um, they were very would be better well, off. So it, it, yeah. financially, you're probably correct, but they specifically no, do that. I, I don't know what they make. I mean, <laughs> really, so I, I can't say, but they they specifically <laughs> were interested in being laid off. They are coming into the bus garage. They are <laughs> performing uh, some tasks around there and maintenance and that sort of thing. And they would prefer not to be laid off. So, and for the time that's left, we felt that was, Fine. But they could make more money being on unemployment right now. I, you broke up. I'm sorry. What? I said you've spoken to all of them on that, and they know, and they know they could be making more money on unemployment right now with the six hundred dollar extra that the feds are kicking in. Uh, that they had been spoken to, and that they would prefer not to. I mean, clearly we didn't go speak to them directly, but uh, their representative had told us that. Correct. Okay. John. Uh, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Are the bus drivers our employees or first students employees? They're first students employees. So we have no control over what they do. I mean, we have to pay this contract no matter what. The contract is, is for busing services. The bus drivers themselves work for first student. We have no control over that and we don't pay them. So it's not our, you know, we have to pay the contract for the bus service, whether they put their bus drivers on unemployment or not it's still i don't think it's a it's a relevant point to trying to save money because they're not our employees well just something to keep in mind with all of this we, like i said we don't know what next year is going to look like if it's virtual school might tell you that was mike yeah, that's my yeah. yeah. Yeah, there you go. Okay. So if it's virtual school and we don't need a bus, there's that. But then you've got the other situation where if we have to figure out busing with social distancing, we may need more buses, more bus drivers. We don't know what it's going to look like. So we don't want to get in a situation where we've kind of already, you know, created issues before we know what we're going to need. Um, so that that was kind of the, the position that we were coming from, from the budget committee. And All Suzanne, right, I'm gonna, quick, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, finish up. I'm going to go to Mike as soon as you're done. Okay, uh, Suzanne, I was just going to tell you, I, I believe when we had our last update from the uh, busing uh, director that he had said that the, the app that they'd put together did um, link up with our system and that our, our routes have been streamlined. Mike? Mike? Yeah, I, I had a your computer sound. Oh, that'd be a great. <laughs> or maybe step away from the computer while you speak. 
Is it off? No, just okay. You know, no. The only question I have is what what is happening in, in other districts? I mean, we're not the only one that have a contract with the uh, private company to do our busing. What's going on statewide? Most other districts are are paying their contracts. One of the things um, this was uh, brushed up against in this discussion, but one of the cautions that uh, we have received um, from our legal advisors is that in terms of these third party contracts, it's possible, um, as John pointed out, since we don't control uh, what these companies do with their employees, it's possible that a company could reassign their employees to take a position somewhere else doing something else in the organization. And if that employee uh, denies that position, then they would lose their job. So um, they asked us to just be careful of those things and mindful that um, taking care of our employees through the third parties um, is, is something that boards want to consider. Uh, I can speak directly about the county that um, none of the county school districts have opted to lay off their bus drivers, uh, whether they uh, own the employees or provide are provided to third uh, party companies. Yeah, there, there's only a few weeks left this year. We don't know what's going to happen in the fall. I don't think we should be messing around with it. Hello? All right. We got that, Mike. Right. Did, you, uh, did you have anything else to add? If not, I will mute you and you can jump back to your computer. Okay. Yeah, the other thing is the busing company for students, if they're getting money from that PPP loan, they have to bring their employees to work. They're, yeah, they're paying them right now. Yeah, so they're basically double dipping. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. And their employees are even better off to be laid off right now. They'd make more money. I mean, just fiscally, it makes sense. But... <laughs> well, I believe uh, it probably bears more discussion. However, they are their employees and we hold a contract with them for services. Even if we stop paying them, it's no sign that they would lay the employees off for the next month. Uh, I think that's uh, something to consider is we aren't talking about employees. We're talking about paying a contract we have. What the company mm -hmm. does with the money and how they treat their employees is beyond our control. Right. Yep. All right. Any further discussion on the busing? All right. Let's move on to next discussion item, which is a review of the resolution granting emergency powers to superintendent. Tim, you wanted to discuss this earlier. Would you like to lead off? Sure. Nothing against Rick or anything here, but I think if we've learned anything, um, what's been going on with this COVID-19, um, especially at the state level here, um, is that you just don't give up your powers. And, and our job is to be the check and balance. I mean, if there's any kind of emergency that Rick needs funding for, you know, we can have an emergency meeting immediately. Um, but this right here from Neola, um, you know, essentially says Rick could do whatever he wants, doesn't, you know, can change the um, bylaws or ignore them. And um, so I, I am definitely not for this at all. Um, I get that we have this COVID-19 thing going on, um, but there is no emergency that is going to be that extreme that he's going to need these emergency powers. I just don't see it happening. I mean, if, you know, if we were in school right now and a and a student showed up and, you know, or got tested for COVID and they had it, then, you know, Rick's going to call off school just like he would a snow day um, and then get some people in there to clean. Um, but even for that, um, if there's something that, you know, 
$50,000 cleaning bill or something that he needs to get approved, we can have an emergency meeting um, right away to get that done. So I don't see where um, giving your superintendent emergency powers um, for this is proper. Um, because why, why are we here as a board then? I mean, why, why are we here? We're seeing it in Lansing. We don't have a check and balance there. Um, we're seeing it in other states. And that, this is our job as board members. We're supposed to be the check and balance. So, and to just give um, emergency powers, I, I don't agree with it at all. So. And I understand what you're saying. I do personally, you know, it's just a, we're, this is our job. This is our job as a board. And to give up those powers as a board, um, it just can't be, I, I just can't vote for that. So um, that's our job. Check, we're supposed to be the check and balance here. So, <clears throat> and we can say all day long that, you know, um, it's just for COVID and this and that, but it doesn't specifically spell that out in this order. Uh, it yeah, does. It, it does. It actually it does. Comply. Yeah. It says that we um, took apply with order 2021 and executive order 202035. And it automatically uh, orders. I, I understand. John, I do too. I understand what he's saying. Yeah. I, right. And then why do it? Why, why do we need to do it? Tell me why. Give me one good reason why we need to do this. Okay. Hang on a second. We're starting to talk over one another and with the delay on the internet, it's pretty bad. So let's take this one at a time. John had his hand up and then we'll move to Becky and then to Suzanne. All right, John. Well, there's a couple points I want to make. Number one, this is recommended by Neola. And I think that obviously they've scrubbed through it pretty good. I read through the document and I don't see where this document says Rick gets carte blanche powers. Um, and at the end of the day, Rick works for the board and the board has the ability to remove him. Um, so I don't foresee Rick doing anything that would put him in harm's way and I don't see anything in this memorandum that gives Rick the power to supersede the board. You know, ultimately the board is still the higher power here and makes the final decisions. This I think is more of a cuts the red tape and there's a lot of board provisions and board bylaws in here that the school's not gonna be able to follow just because of everything that's going on. And it, it goes through, you know, the executive order 2020-35, uh, suspending a lot of things about curriculum, graduation requirements, assessments, things like that. So if you read, I didn't read anything in this document that scared me that gives Rick more power than the board has, but that's my two cents. Becky? I, I would parrot what John said. Um, I, I know Tim's feeling on it. I, I do. Um, but I also feel like, as John said, um, this isn't, Rick's not going to just take this and go crazy. Um, and if something comes up that we can't get the quorum together for whatever reason, he has the, the authority to take care of it. Um, and I trust Rick to do that and do it well. That's why we hired him. Um, I can't see myself anymore over the side here. I wonder why. I can't hear. Okay, I, I guess I was just gonna agree with the other two. And I um I think it's more for, you know, we probably have a bylaw that says, hey, if you don't have X amount of days of school, you can't graduate. He can issue diplomas. He can take care of the daily business that needs to be taken care of. Um, I don't see it as, as any big major things, decisions that he would have to make. He's still going to come to us. And um, I certainly would appreciate it. And Rick can speak to this after I'm done, but I'm sure he'll tell us, you know, anything that is a little out of the ordinary that maybe, you know, goes, you know, he has to relax this, you know, regulation because of this reason, or, you know, he can, he gives us those updates. So I just, if he would just keep us completely up to date, I'd, I would feel fine with it, but I do get what Tim's saying. 
that's all I got. I turn. Now, I just like to, Rick, if you could give us your opinion on this. I'm kind of comfortable with you taking, getting this resolution passed for you. I'm done. Thanks, Bill. Um, by first, I would I would start by saying I'm equally comfortable with or without this resolution. Um, and to Tim's point, I I honestly can't right now think of a situation where um, these emergency powers might come into play. Um, at the same time, I never saw this. COVID shutdown coming either. So I do know that strange things happen. Um, my process for implementing these extended powers would be to work with the board president to at least straw poll board members on issues before taking immediate action, but it, it could um, under unforeseen circumstances uh, give the, the, the district mobility quickly if needed. So the other, I guess the last thing I would say is this was provided by Neola, who we count on for our policy services. Um, their legal team has recommended it to districts um, who are customers of theirs. And it, just based on that, I, I believe that it's a positive thing. I, I'm not gonna recommend or not recommend it to the board because it would be self-serving, uh, I think, to do so. But um, that's my two cents um, in, in terms of using the powers in a specific way strategically. Um, I think, you know, that's just not who I am. All right, before we get back to John, I do have a question for you, Rick. Uh, is there any limitation to the state of emergency powers you already have in our policies and bylaws? Uh, I'm aware that you have some that allow you to address the needs of the district uh, without board consent in a state of emergency, which we are in right now. Mm -hmm. This doesn't grant you any more power than that already that you already have, correct? I don't believe so. I don't know how up to date uh, that emergency power provision is because we haven't reviewed that portion of policy yet. Um, but but I, I don't see that there's, this is just more specific to the executive orders that are in the resolution uh, 2021 and 2035. Um, it, it's very specific to those two orders and um, that's the only difference that I see. And it does sunset when those orders sunset, correct? This is only valid with those orders and any extension of those orders. And it does sunset when those orders are extinguished, correct? Right. Item three of the uh, resolved statements is clear about the temporary powers. All right, thank you. John, you are up next and then Tim has the floor after you. My only question was, if we didn't do this, would we have to discuss and vote on all these different little nuances that have to change that would be based, you know, anytime we're out of compliance with the bylaws, would we have to have a resolution and a vote to, you know, let those lapse for this year? I'm done. <clears throat> The other thing is, is this doesn't even address the cur current executive orders. These, ex or these executive orders that are in here have been rescinded and new ones have been issued. And so this document isn't even accurate at this point. So anything that we were to grant him now doesn't work. Um, so 2021 and 2035 have been rescinded. Um, and there's new orders for those. So this document is new and um, so we can't even vote on it until we get some new stuff from Neola because this, those executive orders are no longer in effect. 
Um, I would agree with Tim in that regard that uh, <clears throat> just in this last week, we have seen those orders sunset and new orders replace them. I don't know as they're considered extensions. I don't believe they are. However, it is important to note that the superintendent does have emergency powers in a state of emergency to handle things already. And if this doesn't convey to him any greater powers, then I think it supported or not won't make a difference functionally. It's just one more piece of uh, paperwork or another resolution we're adding on, which if it's going to sunset with those orders and it's already sunset, or even if it sunsets in two weeks, I don't think it's probably necessary to do it personally. Well, that's my two cents on it. Does anyone else have anything to add? All right, then we are on to final budgets revisions for 2019 and 2020. Is Rick, were you going to present this or was uh, Nikki going to present? Oh, I think that the, the final budget revisions um, is something that, that Nikki can uh, talk to or, or answer questions on. And then um, probably jointly, she and I will talk a little bit about um, fiscal 2021. Okay, stand by just a second, please. John, you had your hand up. Was this on the budget revision or the previous discussion? The budget. Um, but I'll let Nikki go first if we want to let her go. There was, there were a couple items that we discussed in the budget committee meeting that I wanted to know if she had any more information on it. Okay. After they present, then we'll get to that. Nikki, oh. floor is yours. Oh. Thank you. So in your packet, can you Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, so in your packet was um, your your normal reports. So um, you'll see on the, the resolution sheet for just general fund, the one that shows, um, you know, a column for audited actual projected first revision, kind of the life cycle of the budget for the 1920 year. Um, you'll see uh, there in the most, the right hand column is the budget that you're that you've been given for final revision and um, if we start at the top the the gist of the changes here um, in revenue are uh, so the local services the main uh, areas where we lost revenue were in those programs that um, were self-sustaining um, and brought in their own revenue such as tuition-based preschool. We did not collect tuition for half of March, April, May, June, um, before and after care. Um, we did not have um, anything collected for athletics for the spring. Um, um, little little pockets of money that really added up to that, that loss, which was quite, I mean, $200,000, quite substantial. So, um, that's the change to the local service sources for revenue. Um, state stayed the same. Um, the order was that, you know, if you kept, uh, if you employed your staff uh, at, at the beginning, the order said that our state aid would not change. So um, it's roughly the same. Uh, federal sources, that line basically just mirrors the expenses. So uh, what we spent in federal on the expense side, we will receive on the uh, revenue side. Um, they'll just even each other out. So just that line really just depends on how much we spend in our federal grants and how much we're carrying over from year to year. And that's Title One, Title Two, II, Title IV. Um, and, and then the 500, 600 revenue line, um, that's the special ed uh, money from the ISD. Um, and then other small other small uh, transfers in. So in total, um, really the meat of the cut to our revenue there, that 200,000, it's, it's really just those local sources um, in those programs that I mentioned before. Um, expenses. So all in all, we uh, reduced our expenses uh, primarily due to this quarantine um, by 
a little over three hundred thousand uh, dollars, three hundred fifty thousand dollars, and we um, really see a net uh, benefit for us. Unfortunately, I mean it's good and bad, um, and uh, that would leave us with a projected fund balance of that four point four two five um, number there. That is um, in a projected fund balance of um, fifteen point nine four percent. Um, what I do want to mention here is, um, as always, this is a very conservative budget, but um, I did add um, in full some grants that may or may not move at all. So, for example, the school safety grant, that's, um, I think it was close to $150,000 I have in this budget, and that's only if they can resume work in June. So if not, that's you know a substantial amount of money that we will not spend. Um, of course, that's a grant, so it's mirrored with the revenue. But um, I guess what I'm trying to say is that we will we will probably come underneath that. Uh, um, I mean, we have to by law, but um, I mean, uh, we'll 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 be in a much better position. Sorry, stuttering. Um, okay, so. You also received, well, do you have any questions on the Fund 11? Budget. No. I see no questions, Nikki. Go ahead, okay. proceed. Um, in the detail reports, there's a detail report for expenses and there's a detail report for revenue. Um, to summarize those beyond Fund 11, the pool fund, um, which is also, as we know, um, the revenue there, the millage, but also just sustaining, you know, themselves um, collecting their own revenue. So they took a hit to revenue there. However, um, they were already on track to um, spend less than they had anticipated. So they'll actually, they're actually projected to add to their fund balance a um, uh, little over $15,000 if all goes according to plan. So that is uh, good news. Um, Fund 25, food service, um, they are, we kept them on as we did for first student. We are paying the full Aramark bill just as we are for first student. And so since they are not collecting for those, uh, for their sales, like they would normally be, um, they are going to dip into fund equity. Um, they're self-sustaining and they have a healthy fund equity. So um, I think it was 110,000, around 110,000 last year and fund equity. So um, they will be okay, um, but we will be dipping into fund equity for food service. Um, and then debt service, like I mentioned before, um, that's fund 35, uh, that fund will result in a, a lower millage for next year. Um, because we're making up more money than we had originally anticipated in interest. Um, so the things that John, I think, John had asked about was on that original sheet that you saw from the budget committee meeting, um, down the, the, the bottom half is in regards to final revision. And um, I had put there that utilities, we were on track to save $10,000, around $10,000. We received our April bills. Um, in April, we uh, saved $11,400 compared to last year's electrical bill. That's just electrical. So $11,400 in one month saved in electrical. Um, and then $1,500 in gas, which um, I'm assuming will just dwindle to probably nothing since gas will, would have been turned off in May and June or very low. Um, anyway, so um, that's around 12 12 five uh, a month um, and I had only um, planned for 10,000 in all so we were looking at a much better situation there too um, and then um, there's one more question John that I don't remember what it was it had to do with copiers I think John what was the other question you had can you unmute Okay, you didn't, I was trying to unmute myself. There were a couple. Um, one was the, the excess excise taxes that we were gonna go back and ask for a student about um, to see if we could get that revenue back going beyond what they originally said. Um, there was the cost of closing the buildings. Um, if we were doing virtual, just to know what that number was. 
um, we had talked about um, potentially um, doing something with our contract with first student. Um, I think those were the big ones. And then the move, um, the move costs. But I don't think those are in the, those weren't in the budget. We were just going to pull the move costs from, um, I think, the strategic fund or the yeah. capital fund. Yeah, yeah. Um, so capital projects has, at the end of this year, um, and have a little over $100,000 left that we will roll over into next year. Um, and that, de and depending on the decision that's made um, regarding the move, um, that would be used for the move if the move were to, you know, move forward this summer. Um, but other than those funds, there was not a budget in place for the um, the reconfiguration. Um, we were anticipating putting a budget together and putting it in next year's budget for July and August, um, and we will do that depending on the decision um, that you guys make for the summer. In regards to first student, I have not contacted first student. I do need to speak with Rick about contacting them. I'm not sure if I should be the person contacting them, but um, we can contact them about the excise tax issue. Um, yeah, that's a substantial amount of money, so. I think the only other thing that I had um, asked Rick to take a look at was just to make sure that someone is going through the buildings and making sure that the temperatures were set at a reasonable, you know, temperature, all the lights were off, everything's unplugged, things like that, just to try to cut down on our energy costs. But that doesn't do, that's not part of the budget. Okay, that's all I have for all right. final revision. All right, any other questions for Nikki on final revision? All right, that looks like it'll bring us right to the 2020-2021 budget assumptions and projections. Well, the um, I, I think the primary thing that all of us are waiting for in um, central administration across the state is the um, economic projections report that is due on May 15th that will um, be far more specific in terms of what revenues are projected to be lost uh, due to uh, this, this COVID shutdown across the nation. Right now, the range that we're being told is anywhere from one to $4 billion. Um, that's a, that's a large range. Th this uh, projection on the 15th hopes to target that uh, more specifically so that uh, folks like Nikki and myself can get, uh, get to work on exactly what the results uh, of those losses would be. However, in anticipation of that, um, we've been recommended and, and have tried to be somewhat proactive in terms of setting some tiers for what um, budget reductions could look like. So on the uh, proposed fiscal year 2021 budget considerations, uh, we are looking at cuts from 200,000 all the way up to worst case scenario of uh, $680 per student to our foundation allowance. And then uh, on that same table, the, the ultimate uh, total dollar amount, when you multiply that loss times the number of our students uh, in the uh, count ending this year. So you have a table that looks at what are the potential losses based on um, all of the different scenarios that we're being asked to consider. And then below that you have um, a general itemized budget list by department and staffing groups and um, how that would impact the budget next year. This isn't, I wanna be clear about this, um, 
what I've given you is not a list of uh, suggested cuts. This is a list of how much things cost us currently so that the board can begin to wrap their mind around how much each thing costs that we provide. Uh, we expect um, not only from that May 15th projections conference, but also um, as we go through the summer, we expect to have direction from the governor's office and the Department, Department of Education on what sorts of things moving into next year uh, should be in the budget and what might not need to be in the budget. We don't know exactly what being back to school is going to look like. So we don't know if the list that I've provided you here is comparable to what those expenses might be next year. But at least to start with, the board has a list of things to consider as of today and how much they cost. Um, and then again, she's already mentioned that there are some savings in uh, this year's budget as a result of not being on campus and, and not providing some of the services that will actually save us a little bit of money. And then um, the impact on the uh, final uh, fun ending fund equity that would improve a little bit over 1% from the projected. So all of those things have to begin to be considered in terms of what our ending financial position is for this year, um, what the potential loss in revenue would mean for next year, and then what do things cost and, and how would they impact our, uh, our budgeting for next year. Um, I don't think that there's going to be any change in the requirement for a balanced budget to be submitted by July 1st, but I do believe that many things will happen after July 1st that will have an impact both negatively and positively on whatever number that we come up with uh, when we submit our, uh, our first proposed budget for next year. Um, so if you have any questions about items on that sheet, or if you're interested in having other information provided so that when we have further discussions, uh, you have the information that you feel is necessary, um, you can submit those requests tonight or uh, at any time, communicate either with Kevin or myself and, and Nikki and I will work on those numbers. Any questions on the budget assumptions and projections? All right, moving right on to the date for our truth and taxation and budget hearing. It's usually set in June, but I wasn't sure what the board's pleasure was, seeing how we don't know if we're having one or two meetings. Um, it's just something to throw out there to start considering when um, Mr. Hilderly and Nikki might want to proceed with having that budget hearing. It has to be in June. That's why it's on there. Just consideration at this time, one meeting, two meetings, moving the second meeting in June to the last Monday to give you more time those options. Uh, Rick and Nikki, I am assuming with all of the budget instability we're experiencing right now and the uncertainty from the state, it would be better to have this later in the month rather than earlier. Absolutely. All right. Uh, board member discussion. We had, oh, sorry. <laughs> Becky? We had talked about um, with the district reconfiguration that projection like drop dead date was June 1st. So we had talked about having our initial meeting to discuss that. I don't know if it makes a big difference, but I just wanted to remind you of that. Uh, maybe we do need to do two meetings in June. Well, I think that our last meeting this month is, uh, I don't have my calendar up. 
but I think that is right before that June 1st date. And mm -hmm. by that time, we should certainly be able to uh, bring ourselves to a decision a few days early. That's for sure. Um, any other thoughts, comments, concerns? All right. Um, food service contract extension for 2021 or 2020, 2021. This is a one year extension of the existing contract, correct? So this is being provided to show you what I will be submitting to MDE as far as um, the contract extension. They actually have to approve it before it comes to the full board, but it's being shared with you so you see what the numbers are. Were there any questions on that? Yeah, so we're not approving anything yet or signing any contract at this point, correct? Just submit it to the state and that's and then revisit it, correct? When the board approved the contract last year, it was for five years and each year extension has to be approved by the board and MDE. Okay. So it's a it's a formality of what you've kind of already done. Okay. But we still have to approve the extension, but, correct? Correct. Okay. Year by year, the extension gets approved. Right. Okay. okay. All right, we'll be sending that to MDE for their approval and then come back to us for our final approval on it, correct? All right, last, the uh, next item up is the 2020-2021 LISD budget. That uh, meeting was held virtually um, and uh, Tim Simpson and I uh, represented the district by listening in. Um, the ISD saved a little money and probably even more time uh, in that they didn't have to serve dinner uh, to that group. Um, although um, I, I appeared in that Zoom meeting without video, so I could say truthfully that I did have a meal while that meeting was going on. Um, but Nothing remarkable from that meeting. Um, uh, the county superintendent admitted that um, while these the numbers in the budget were proposed, that he fully expects that they'll change. Um, and again, not knowing what those changes might be, uh, there, there'll be revisions. Uh, Tim, anything else from that meeting that you remember being something worth mentioning? Um, not really. I mean, it's pretty straightforward. I mean, it was pretty quick. I think what 40 minutes of that. So, um, so it was pretty straightforward. I mean, again, they're in limbo, just like the rest of us. How are you going to do vocational classes when you can't be in person? Um, so that was discussed a little bit, but, uh, um, other than that, nope, look good to me. All right, last thing on our discussion is the district reconfiguration. We're having this discussion because as of right now, we're moving forward with the intent of still doing our district reconfiguration that we voted on in December. However, the landscape, everything has changed. Landscape, finances, there's a lot of change that's happened since we made that vote. And there is a possibility that we may have to step back and uh, reevaluate that. We don't have to make that decision until June 1st. That is the last date that we can uh, make that decision and make the reconfiguration happen successfully and completely. Um, there's certainly no sense in doing something poorly or uh, incompletely. Uh, so we're opening the floor for any discussion or thoughts on the reconfiguration or possibly uh, having to reevaluate the, the rate of reconfiguration at minimum. Now I'm gonna apologize while I was talking, three hands went up. So I will just uh, pick them in the order they appear on my screen. 
and looks like four with Suzanne. So Milt, you are up first. Okay, I can't see us moving forward with this reconfiguration. Just one, we don't know how many students we're gonna have. We're going under a teacher contract and we're looking at budget cuts from the state, which I highly doubt if we're gonna have that by our budget timeline of June 30th. And chances are that won't come in until November when the state finalizes their budget and it could be cut more. I think there's just too many uncertainties to go forward with this. The most important thing is we got to worry about is our students and our teachers. Can I Becky? <laughs> Becky, you're up. Okay, I can see your lips moving. Um, so I, I agree with Milt. Right now, we just don't know what's going to happen. Um, we don't, we have no idea what we're looking at what this landscape is going to be, and that makes it very hard to make any any choices. Um, I but I want it clear that this is not a put off forever. This is a we're going to go to Plan B and it becomes a two-year event, uh, provided, of course, that we get back into a normal school routine. Um, right now, we don't know what a normal school routine is going to look like, and that just makes this re uh, reconfiguration too hard to plan. We may need social distancing in the schools where we need to use every square inch. We just don't know. Um, so with that being said, I, I think we need to consider not moving forward at this time. John? Yeah, when we were at the budget meeting, I asked that we add this to the agenda and mainly because this next year, it's obvious based on everything that we've heard that we're gonna have to save every dollar that we can. So I think, you know, things have changed dramatically since we took this vote. And not only can we not afford to spend additional money, but we need to be looking for ways to save money. Um, so I think once we understand what our budget's going to be, we need to look back at this reconfiguration and see what makes the most sense right now. But I don't think it makes any sense to do the full boat, you know, one year reconfiguration like we had voted on at this point in time. That's it. Suzanne, you're up. <clears throat> um, while I do agree that we have no idea what kind of money we're going to come up with uh, for next year, I value the kids and what they need first. And although I might be in favor of a partial move, as of right now, I still think we should continue down the road, we were going to continue down if we have to do a little less painting or we have to think outside the box and get people to help out in the community. Um, I think it's a draw to go back like it was. That's kind of the whole point of us getting elected. And I think people are expecting that. I do think they would understand, but I don't, I just think it would be better for kids if we did make the move. So I'm all in favor of continuing to do it this this year and I don't I don't really think it's I, CMU has already announced that they're going to have classes this fall I personally know this is an election year and you know things seem to heighten as far as emotions and um, if we can get back into the schools and this lockdown is over with soon um, I don't see a problem with moving and I don't see I see classes going on like they did last year. Um, maybe some parents might hold back. We might have more kids in the virtual academy, and I certainly think we should look down that road. Uh, it's going to be whatever people are comfortable with, but I think they're finding this is not affecting kids, and in fact, that, you know, isolation is not good for your immunity, and um, I think we'll, I think we should march forward. All right, Tim, you're up. 
Yeah, I, I agree with Suzanne and I agree with John as well. Um, you know, what we've got to do here is we got to be thinking long term. And long term is cutting cost. And one way to cut cost is by not having so many bus routes. Um, and we've discussed this numerous times. Um, so this is the problem with organizations that say, oh, I got to cut this, I got to cut this, I got to cut this. We're not thinking long term. And we need to think long term. What's the better? What's better for the students? Moving them now. What's better for the district? Saving money by busing. We've got the money in our um, fund balance to do this. Um, people want it done. That's why we're all sitting here. And we could start doing it right now. I mean, there's no reason we couldn't start doing it right now. Start moving these things right now. Um, I don't see us moving the fifth and sixth graders from upstairs to downstairs. It's just more manpower, more hours. But I do see moving the seventh and eighth graders over to the middle school and moving the second graders to early learning centers like we voted on in the third and fourth at Patterson and um, Herrick Park. And that's what we voted on. And um, we can't become a wishy-washy board and keep changing our mind on things. Um, We've got to move forward. We've got to save money. I know you, sometimes you got to put money out to save money, and that's what we're going to do. So I, I'm I'm not even for putting it back on to be voted on. So you know, we need to move forward. We had a plan. Keep going with the plan. Um, I understand we're in this new world, um, but things are going to get better. The state is gaslighting right now on how much they're going to cut. Um, you know, our property values haven't dropped that much. Okay. <laughs> I know there's some tax, you know, gas prices are down. So the they're not collecting as much tax from that, but it's not like the economy dropped out of the bottom and it's not going to ever recover. So, um, you know, it's a fourth quarter recovery and we'll be back at it. So um, anyway, those are my thoughts on that. So. All right, John, you're up next. I'll, I'll agree with part of what Tim said as far as, you know, we need to do what's best for the students first in the future. But the reality of the situation right now is based on the information that we have, we're going to have to save money. And we do not have an unlimited fund balance. You know, if we take, you know, a million dollar hit, two million dollar hit one or two years in a row, then it's gone. So we have to be, we have a responsibility to the community as, as well as the students to make sure that we keep these schools funded properly. Um, and we don't know what we're gonna have as far as classrooms go. The other piece of it is um, we still have a shelter in place. We cannot have people in the schools right now um, moving. I, I'm, unless Rick can correct me, I'm pretty sure we can't be doing anything inside the schools right now um, other than maybe cleaning, but uh, it doesn't make any sense to spend unnecessary money this year. That's all I've got. Milt, you're up. Okay, back on the financial end of this, just alone, we are being told we could take a $200 per student hit up to $680 per student hit. And we do not know how many students we're gonna have with this COVID. I mean, parents might just be plain afraid to have their children come back to school. To spend up to a million dollars just to move the classrooms around is crazy, period. I'm done. Becky? I just uh, agree with Milt on that one. We just don't know what we're getting into. Uh, as far as the busing, it, if, if we end up back in classes and we have to think about social distancing and buses, are we gonna have one student per seat? You know, we may have to add more buses. So I can't say that we're gonna be saving busing money by shortening routes at this point in time. There's too much we can't say to make those kind of projections. We just don't know. And as far as uh, appearing as a wishy-washy board, this board was not voted in during a time of COVID-19. This is all new. So I, I don't feel that we're being wishy-washy. I mean, I was the one that voted for the restructure. And at this point, knowing what we know, 
I just don't think we can move forward with it. I don't think we can, I, I'm not, you know, I'm not happy with the kids being segregated the way they are with the seventh and the eighth. And I don't really care for any of that, but I think this is more important to give it the year and figure out what we actually need with the current information that we have. We did, we, when we made that vote, COVID-19 wasn't a factor. Now it is. So we need to look at the whole, the big picture. That's all. Tim? Well, first of all, it's not a million dollars to move the classrooms. I don't know where that number came from, but it's not a million dollars. I think I saw something like 120,000. So um, I don't know where the million dollar number came from, but never heard of that. So um, the second thing is when you go through cuts like this, if you have to go through cuts, you, you know, organizations, you just, you just don't start leaking money. You have to make cuts when that happens. And making the move is going to save us money over the long haul. And that's what we have to look at long term. We can't look at the short term right now. We need to look at long term. And if we need to make some cuts in the short term, because our funding is down, then we'll make some cuts. That's what we have to do. But overall, we have to look at the long term, what's best for the school, money wise, and for the students. That's what we're here for. Um, I understand everybody's a little paranoid about this COVID thing. But we've got to look long term and this is where organizations make a mistake and this is where they get into trouble financially because they aren't willing to make the hard cuts, the hard decisions that need to be made if you're funding, if you're not getting enough funding. Um, you see this all the time in the public sector. I mean, Detroit was notorious for it. I mean, how many times did they go bankrupt? You know, so you've got to right size your organization for your funding and, you know, it and if we're going to take a $600 hit, it might be more students in the classroom because we can't control that. Um, so we've got to look at those things. But if we're not looking at them um, that for long term and short term cuts that we might need to make, then we're not doing our, I don't feel we're doing our job correctly. So, Suzanne? I also want to say that. Um, Tim's right in the sense that we will save money in the long run being in that in that new configuration and the students will be getting what they need and how many students might we lose if we decide not to do it uh I mean you can look at it that way too that that's a big problem to not have a middle school uh you know where they can go to a real art class and have gym and I just don't think we should, for $100,000, I don't think we should sacrifice one iota of, uh, you know, education for our kids. And I think the move furthers education. And I think it, you know, it should have never happened that we put, you know, eighth and seventh and eighth graders in elementary buildings. But now that we have and we've decided to move them back, I, I just think we, we would be doing a disservice to the community. Uh, for a hundred thousand dollars that's nothing compared to our budget and i totally agree with tim that we need to make some hard cuts and if that means less teachers or less programs or whatever because of our funding but i don't think we should assume the worst but i think we should be ready to make cuts but not when it comes to uh students and their learning john yeah, now I've heard two people mention that we're going to save money with this reconfiguration, and, and I don't know that we've ever discussed saving money with this reconfiguration. This reconfiguration was totally about um, better serving our students' educational needs. It was not a savings of money. Um, I believe that there were some very minute savings in busing um, that we were projecting, but we still don't know the bus routes and we don't have a confirmed bus cost for this reconfiguration as far as I understand. Um, and the move is not gonna be 100,000 or 120,000. We, we know based on the information that we've seen that the previous big move was at least a half a million dollars. Now this move is not gonna be as intrusive as the last move um, because we're not ripping up gym floors and everything else. but 
there's no way we're going to do this move for $100,000. And in a time when we desperately need to make sure we're saving every dollar that we can, $100,000 is a lot of money. Um, you know, we could have saved that hundred thousand dollars by not buying copiers and, you know, instead of leasing them, but there's a lot of things that we need to look at here beyond just, um, the potential minute savings that we may have from this reconfiguration, because personally, I don't think we're going to save money with this reconfiguration. I think it's going to be, it's going to cost a lot more than a hundred thousand dollars. And the big thing is we don't even know how many students we're going to have, um, next year in the classroom and what the classroom is going to look like. So to even think about trying to spend a dime on moving right now, I think is foolish. That's all I've got. All right. Is there, oh, Mike? Uh, hold on a second. Okay, Mike. Okay. We weren't going to make a decision until the 1st of June anyway, when we're informed as what we're going to have to do. Given what's going on in Lansing, we may be in one or two more extensions and it might not even be up to us. That's it. All right. That, uh, that is a very good point. What I would like to add to this discussion, as soon as I mute Mike's phone, what I'd like to add to the discussion is uh, the scope of our consideration should go beyond simply financial. Uh, long term, yeah, I think long term, it's a benefit for our students and it's a benefit for the district's pocketbook. Um, it might be a very small benefit to the pocketbook when it's all said and done, but thinking very long term, I think it's more efficient and we're standing a, a good chance of saving some money. But beyond financial, operationally, with everything else that's going on right now, the deciding factor for me isn't going to be finance. It's going to be what is Rick, what is the administration, what are the teachers, what is everybody tasked with over the summer? What is this going to look like going into fall? I don't think the state's going to make a decision on what next school year is going to look like until the 11th hour, which for us is too late. They're probably going to wait till the very last minute, barring a widespread pandemic outbreak, twice as bad as it is right now. They're going to wait till the last minute to make the decision that we're going back to school or we're not, which means our administration and all the employees are going to have to look towards starting school physically in the fall, while at the same time preparing to start, start school virtually. That's the big consideration for me is what is the workload? Are they gonna have the time resources and the people resources to get school prepared for both virtual and physical and get their reconfiguration done? That's something that I can't answer. That has to come from Rick and the administration staff. And that's something that is probably more important than the money, to be honest with you. Not saying that money isn't important, but the deciding factor in whether we have to back off the aggressiveness of this move, I think depends on the resources we have beyond money. And with that, I see John, you have your hand up. Yeah, I agree with what you're saying. And I think that, you know, the other piece of this puzzle is, is Rick's resources and Rick himself, you know, Rick only has so many hours a day that he has to focus on different tasks right now and with everything else going on to try to add the task of moving, um, I think is, a, is not a good use of his time. I think that what you just said is exactly what Rick's energies need to be put into along with the rest of the staff is how do we prepare for a virtual um, classroom next year and how do we create the best virtual classroom in the district? You know, if you want to be the strongest district, um, if you want to be the strongest school in the district right now, I think the focus is going to be going towards a virtual program. And as far as I understand, we definitely have the strongest virtual program in the county. I think we need to make sure that 
we have that up and running and prepared properly um, going into the fall versus worrying about classrooms. Because I think the virtual academy is going to be where we're going to see our most growth in our in, in our biggest retention area. And that's it. Suzanne? Um, I personally think we might see a few more virtual, but I think this thing is going to blow right over and it's not realistic to have like all virtual. So we already do a great job with virtual. I think we should prepare physically and virtually for both, but we can't prepare physically if we can't even make a simple move. I mean, I don't know if it's only $100,000 and we're not doing ripping out floors and we're just moving and people show up to a different building um, and that's what's best for kids and it's that inexpensive and the staff is okay with it. I mean, people already haven't worked since two months ago. Uh, people might be anxious to you know, get in there and dig in both virtually and, but, but to think that it's going to be just virtual is, is just absurd. I think that that's just not going to happen. And, and it, it won't work. It's not the same. I mean, some virtual, all virtual, no, it, it's going to be a combination of the both, just like it is now. It might be heavier one way than the other, but I just think we have to have our eyes on the target and keep doing what's best for kids in all respects. That means cutting, that means, you know, making a move, but keeping it cheap. That means employing people to help, volunteers. That means, you know, looking virtually to do whatever we can do for whatever students want that route and be the best we can be there and attract students uh, from every walk of life. And I just, I, I can't even believe we're splitting hairs over a, a move that costs $100,000 or even 150. Rick, you had something to add? Um, yeah, obviously uh, you will eventually want to have a recommendation from me when you make this decision in two weeks. So I try to give you as much information on my updates as possible. But tonight I was really interested in hearing your thoughts and, and questions. Uh, before giving some straightforward advice. So let me try to answer those questions um, and then I will give you my advice on the subject. Um, and I'll sort of put an asterisk by it in that in two weeks, there, there may be information that I don't have now that would uh, potentially change my opinion. But uh, to some of the smaller points, first of all, John mentioned um, you know, can people be in the building right now? Uh, the executive order um, talks about staff having access to the building specifically for um, the implementation of the continuity of learning plan. So we do have some staff who come and go from their classroom from time to time, um, but with the stay at home order in the specific language from the executive order, it would not be appropriate for me to direct staff to go to their classroom um, until those thing ex things expire uh, for the purpose of packing and preparing for a move. Now, that alone does not uh, disallow us from preparing for a move because we had originally planned to have that packing uh, and preparation done um, approximately the second week of June. So we could still make that happen. Um, but I do believe that it's important to uh, remember several other things related to the move because as, as Tim mentioned, there's thinking long-term, but I also have the, um, I have the need to look at the big picture. And there is certainly the, the cost of the move. And I'll just talk for a little bit about the budget stuff. There's the, there, there's the actual cost of moving things. Uh, boxing it up, putting it on trucks, delivering it, unpacking it. Um, so there's the material cost. There's the cost of potentially moving some of the playground equipment. Uh, you mentioned uh, painting and some of the flooring that we were going to redo. Uh, some of those things could be deferred. However, 
when we first devised this plan of reconfiguration, the program that you were being proposed was not a one-for-one -one program of what's in place now. The reconfiguration program, in order to deal with equity in the contract for planning time um, and for curriculum delivery was, um, and, and Nikki took good notes on this as we had our discussions over the winter, um, it was potentially going to add about $600,000 to the budget. We were looking at the addition of uh, four teaching staff, one administrator and one counselor. At the time, we were being projected to increase revenue for next year by $700,000. So when you look at those potential tiers of what each cut might be, what that doesn't take into consideration in, is what we were already assuming we were going to get. So you would start with that number at 700,000, come down to zero and then cut potentially another 1.8 million if the doomsday projections of $680 per student were in place. So um, while it's not a million dollars, it's, it's closer to a million dollars than it is 100,000 to not only make the physical move, but put the program in place that I had presented to you and that you had promised our staff and students and, and families. I can tell you specifically today, I cannot put the program in place that was proposed to you last year based on the budget projections that we're seeing now. And therefore, just financially, I could not recommend to you that this move take place. We would not be able to implement the programming. We would not be able to put the configuration of the grade levels with the necessary supports, the classes that were supposed to be offered, uh, and maintain equitable planning time throughout the district, which was part of the program that was promised. And then finally, there's what's best for kids. And that's the most important part of what I'm talking about. Right now, the staff should be on um, about week eight of planning, and preparing for these new classrooms, new buildings, new administration. By now, we probably should have already uh, at least posted for, if not hired, the additional staff to be a part of those discussions. Certainly appointed um, a middle school assistant principal and a new counselor to be a part of those discussions. None of that has happened. We've not been able to get together to plan and prepare for the program that we want to put in place. And we're not going to be. Not if we have to also prepare for the different possibilities for how curriculum and instruction is going to look for next fall, whether it's completely offsite and online, whether it's a hybrid plan that involves some social distancing and split schedules or a mix. We're not sure what those things are gonna be. And therefore, I can't say that moving is the best thing for students. I do know this. I know that it makes sense to uh, have second grade stay at the ELCs next year because for their social and emotional well-being, knowing that they don't have to leave their building and we could roll some of their teachers forward uh, at least to begin the year if they're in an online environment so that they can have some idea of normalcy in terms of how they're gonna approach school. By now we should have had first graders visit the new sites or second grade kids visit the new sites, sixth grade kids visit the new site. Um, and again, none of that is happening. We don't know when we're going to be able to allow that sort of thing to happen. 
Um, so social, emotionally, educationally, financially, I sitting here tonight cannot recommend that the program that we promised the district when we made the decision to reconfigure in one year, I cannot recommend that the board move forward because I can definitely not put in place the program that was submitted to you when we made that decision. Um, ask me my opinion again in two weeks. It may move one way or the other based on new information. Certainly we'll have a better idea of what the financial projections are. But again, we had made some assumptions about what our income level was going to increase. And the program that we had planned to put in pay, place was more expensive than the program that we have in place this year. And, it, and, and if we move forward with the move, we're going to have to deal with that. Thank you, Rick. Any further discussion on the district reorganization? All right. Barring further discussion, we're on to our action items. Uh, let's pause for just a second here. I want to make sure before we get to action items that all members are uh, present. I seem to have lost Tim's feed. Tim, are you with us? All right, hold on a sec. There's Tim, he's back with us. All right, everyone is unmuted. We are up to our action item, which is the resolution granting emergency powers to the superintendent presented to us by Viola. Can I get a motion on that resolution? Kevin, I, we already, uh, I, the resolution has old executive orders in it that have been rescinded. So this will have to be rewritten before we could actually approve this. All right, could I get a motion to then uh, remove this from the action items and set it aside? So moved. For Roll call, Milt. Aye. Kevin, aye. Mike. Aye. John. Aye. Suzanne. Aye. Becky. Aye. Tim. Aye. All right, the action item is set aside for future consideration after rewrite. Next on the agenda is the superintendent's report. Mr. Hilderly. Yeah, you have a couple of things that appear on your agenda. I wanna add one more. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the Building Futures Committee. Just add that bullet point to your agenda. Uh, first of all, the continuity of learning plan. Um, I alluded to it earlier. Um, it continues to move forward. We have made some subtle changes here and there. Uh, we were approached by uh, music and art teachers, um, K-4, uh, asking if they could do some additional and supplemental programming for students. Um, so they've worked uh, out a plan where they're, they're um, doing some of their own art and music presentations and, and, and uh, Zoom sessions. Um, we saw a high degree of engagement uh, the first couple of weeks um, as we move into week four, uh, especially at the lower levels, that's, that's beginning to wane a little bit. Um, you know, it's, it's difficult for families because, you know, a, a second grade kid isn't going to log on to a classroom Zoom session on their own. A parent's going to have to sit there with them. So 
as as people um, either go back to work or or have added responsibilities, they're just not able to do those things. Um, we've seen a little bit of an increase in the paper packet um, participation, so that's probably balanced with the people who've decided to maybe not engage electronically as much. Um, but in general, the core of what we had planned is moving forward. Um, the feedback that I receive through the building administrators who get feedback from um, the classroom teachers is that the core of people are pretty satisfied with what we have offered. Um, some would like more and some aren't, some aren't engaging at all. Um, but, but the core of people in terms of the response from the staff uh, that I'm told about is that we're mostly on target. Um, we'll continue to deliver those uh, paper packets, although we expect that, that um, especially the ELCs, which gave out their package in, in a seven week bundle, um, we don't expect that to increase, but uh, the grade levels at Compass continue to produce things week by week. So um, we, we are continuing to do that along with the food distribution um, at both South and the high school um, on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Um, 2021 planning, uh, you know, it's, it's been the topic of much of the discussion tonight. Um, in, lots of times in schools, we call this time of year a moving target. Uh, this year, I would call it an invisible target. Um, we know that the, there's numbers out there and, and we can guess at them, but this is the first time in my experience in education that there has been um, suggested amount of cuts that even the people who suggest them can't be clear or specific about what those cuts might be. I've never seen um, something come out from the State Department of Ed or from the professional organizations to say, you should plan for these five or six different levels of cuts. So it's unprecedented. Um, we try to work with each other in terms of superintendents, and, and but most of the time when I have those conversations, we, we end up right back where we started, which is there's just so much that we don't know. So we are planning for lots of things that may not end up happening. Um, we're planning for what things would look like in a virtual environment. We have uh, a pretty good idea of what um, platform we would use moving into next year. Uh, we have an idea of how we could get training for that. Um, we're making plans for uh, curriculum and what additions might need to take place for the full virtual environment. We're also making plans for an environment that might be hybrid where uh, kids are in in small numbers, maybe different days of the week or um, different portions of a day. We've had those discussions. So we are theorizing lots of different ways in our planning and, and we will eventually get to the point where we have some concrete plans for each of the possibilities and, and all the while knowing that maybe 75% of our work uh, will go untouched later on and then we'll move forward with um, a particular plan when we're given more guidance. But um, we have to be prepared regardless and um, you know, knowing whether or not we're gonna go forward with the, rec the uh, reconfiguration is a piece to the puzzle for us, uh, for our planning. And um, so I, I appreciate the fact that John brought this forward as an agenda item to be discussed in May um, so that we can either eliminate or, or include that in our, in our planning process. There are lots of moving parts. And again, it's, it's not a target that we can see very well at this point. And, and the administrative team is working on a daily basis, meeting at least weekly to discuss all these things. and. Uh, going to come up with as many solid plans as we can and, and implement uh, what needs to be done when the time comes. 
Um, and then lastly, the Building Futures Committee, uh, we're continuing to plan and replan that. We're on our third revision of dates now that um, have come as a result of stay at home orders. So right now we're looking at a, a kickoff date for that you know, the 2nd of June. And um, it's possible that that first meeting could be in a virtual environment, but if, if we are able to work in a, in a live session, um, we'll follow all the distancing and safety guidelines that are, that are in place at that time. And, and we'll start that discussion um, in, in having some uh, hopefully rich conversation about the facility needs for the district moving forward. Um, there's a, a calendar that uh, has been revised that I can have uh, Terry share with you, but each time that a, a new date moves things back, uh, we just work with our associates to adjust that schedule and we communicate that to the members of the committee. So those are the three things that I wanted to update the board on. And uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Do we have any questions for Rick tonight? It looks like Tim. Hey, Rick, I got a call from a parent about an eighth grade parent wondering, um, are we doing pre-algebra now in high school? That was one of the classes being offered because I don't remember that being offered last year. Yeah, so, is for it, high school students? Yeah. Um, it, it's a possibility that we may need to offer that. I'm, I'm not sure what the numbers would be. We, we had talked about possibly having one class carry forward for pre-algebra needs. Okay. All right. Is that because the math program wasn't working or, or, or do you know what the particulars are on that? Based on individual student need, so I, you know, I haven't seen statistics that would say one way or the other why it is that there'd be a group that would be um, needing the pre-algebra retake. Um, the cause is, at least to me, right at this time, uh, unattributed to any factors other than student need. Okay. All right. Is there any? Can we get a report of like? the new program versus the old program to see how the student growth was. Um, Cause they were, I think, I think they were ran in this, one was ran in one steam center and it wasn't ran in the other or something. I have asked the, um, the math department heads to make a decision about their um, curriculum needs moving forward. So they will be coming to the board um, probably the first June meeting to talk about the program needs and, and they can be making some comparisons at that time. Um, my direction to them was um, to, to pick a standard curriculum that we're going to follow and enforce. And that at that time, uh, all levels will be in compliance. Okay, okay. Yeah, I'd like to see the new program that we use, you know, data on that compared to uh, yeah, um, it'll be a little bit tough to compare apples to apples only because of this goofy situation we're in. We don't have a full year of, of uh, comparisons that we can make. But well, we'll be able, uh, we'll be able to see we'll the have, growth. We'll be we able to see the some pretty good some pretty good growth um, from the beginning of the year until the time that we were uh, right. shut out. And, right. and they'll they'll definitely want to present that when they come to the board. Yeah, because I mean, we got the NWEA data from the fall and yeah, you had fall and winter. You just didn't have spring. Um, right. There's usually a dip between fall and winter, and then a resurgence in spring. So the numbers may not even be as strong as you would want them to be. But we'll we'll definitely have them uh, mm -hmm. present that information. Okay. All right. Thank you, John. You have something to add. Rick, Rick answered my question. I just, I was under the impression last year when the math department put all that time and effort over the summer into this program, that it was the standard curriculum for everyone um, throughout the grade, you know, six through 12. Um, so 
I guess I was surprised to understand that there was not everyone was on the same page with the math curriculum last year. And I want to make sure going forward that we're all on the same page um, with, with all our curriculums. Yeah, honestly, I haven't, been, I haven't known what, uh, how to enforce curriculum in the math department, but um, that won't be the problem moving forward. Perfect. All right, thank you. Anything else to add? It doesn't appear so. We're moving on to our consent agenda. Could I get a motion to approve the consent agenda? I hereby move to approve the consent agenda, which includes the following items. Minutes from the regular board meeting, April 13 of 2020. Minutes from the board policy committee meeting of May 5th, 2020. Minutes from the board budget committee meeting of May 6th, 2020. And the April monthly check registry. Second. Apologies. Roll call. Milt? Aye. Kevin? Aye. Mike? Aye. John? Aye. Suzanne? Aye. Becky? Aye. Tim? Aye. The motion passes unanimously. That brings us to items scheduled for the next agenda. Discussion items next time around will be GASB 84, some enthralling financial law. Action items will include the board policies for the 1000-2000 series and the date for truth and taxation and budget hearing. Also included are, will be the food service contract extension the LISD budget and the district reconfiguration decisions. That takes us to our closing. We have a second public comment. Let me verify, I did not have any registrants pop up for that. So we are on to board member comments and discussion. Any board member comments or discussion? All okay. right then person again. again. I'm, looking, I'm looking forward to being this person again. <laughs> and I think we are all chocolate looking forward cookies. to chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> all right, that brings us to an adjournment. Could I get a motion to adjourn, please? So so support. All in favor. Aye. 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 Meeting is adjourned. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone. See you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>